So yeah, I'm, uh, I actually work for the Potato Commissions, and uh, during my work days, I'm actually just a paper shuffler. Um, and nowadays, you don't shuffle papers, you, you send everything by email and so forth. Um, so what I'm talking about today is my actual research interest, which I do on weekends and on vacation. Um, and that's, uh, I'm, the, I'm the oldest school of old school uh, natural history and taxonomist type person. Um, and you don't get to see any data at all today from me. So what I've done for the past 25 years, almost everywhere I go, all year round, is collect aphids, described a bunch of species, and, and learned a lot of things, published quite a few papers over the years. These are some of the aphids that I've described, and uh, with uh, potato aphid in the middle. These are the tools I've used in the field. I use a piece of plywood as a beating sheet, and a paint uh, stirring stick as a stick to beat the plants with. And then obviously you have to have a hand lens. And since I turned 40, I had to add uh, glasses. Because you realize that you can't see anything um, when you're standing next to a teenager or something. You've got to add those. And sometimes I even have another pair on my head, even higher magnification, so I can see even better. And this is what the board looks like. You can't see that all that well, which is why you need glasses. But there's uh, actually aphids all over this. And for me, the plywood works well, the mix of colors and things. Um, and texture, the, the bugs can grab onto it really well so, it's, so they don't get blown away. Um, and this is actually from a potato field, so there's lots of green peach aphids and some ladybugs and things. And this is my, my lab, which is uh, one side of my little office in my house. I, I get to work at home, which is a fabulous thing about my job. So on the, on the left side of my room is where the paper shuffling goes on, and this is the, my collection. So I have about 8,000 slides now, um, most of them aphids and uh, just a, a little bit of uh, uh, silid slides. Make all the slides myself and everything, obviously. Um, a, lot of field, uh, a lot of field work. So over 25 years, I, I don't know how many thousands of hours I've spent in the field in all different kinds of places. Um, uh, you know, Utah, uh, Idaho, and even this year in, in Switzerland, and Germany and Austria. Always collecting aphids everywhere I go. And some people can tell, you know, horrifyingly uh, embarrassing stories about me crawling around the bushes in downtowns of big cities and stuff. Um, so since 2011, I've added psyllid collecting to my work uh, because they're in the same place as aphids are. They're obviously, uh, you know, very similar, closely related. And uh, it's been a real fun experience to learn psyllids. And so when I say psyllid natural history, it's just all kinds of psyllids everywhere I go, uh, just having a look at what they're doing, um, I haven't learned how to identify them yet in general. I've just been collecting them, mounting them, and learning about them in the field as I go around, because you can kind of recognize the species. Even though I don't know what species they are, I recognize them as I go around all over the West. So the, one of the main goals is actually agriculture related. We, we, there's a few species or fruit, few categories, I don't know if they're species or genera or what, that we see a lot of in, um, in our sticky trapping in the West. And so one goal was to learn about what some of those are and where they live. And uh, as a taxonomist, I'm just interested in collecting lots of fresh material, making decent mounts. Although I do it all slide mounting, which I know is a, a faux pas maybe with psyllids, but I do it anyway. And then um, learn about the psyllid field biology. And again, that's just old-fashioned natural history, just walking around looking what they're doing, where they're living, um, what kind of habitats they like. And then just uh, see what kind of unexpected things I might find. So I need some other tools, uh, too, that I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, we do almost all of this by camping. And you need a vehicle that gets to all kinds of places. And, and this is our, 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 our house when we're out camping. Um, and we go to places like this, same, same setup, vehicle and a, and a house. And we face some hazards along the way. Uh, this one was in New Mexico this year. Um, some difficult road conditions from time to time. And uh, this one was in Utah a couple of years ago. I actually don't see very many rattlesnakes, but, but they're, they're fun to get pictures of. And we've been to a lot of different places. And by we, I mean my significant other, Gina, and our dogs. And this is where we live, uh, near Boise, Idaho now. So all the work was uh, from a home base near Boise. Um, did a little bit of solid work out here in the past year, too. So I'm just going to show you a few slides to get you a feel for all the places we've been. Um, 
These are some areas near the Boise area, and I've talked about some of these before when I was working with bittersweet nightshade in the area. Uh, this, is, this is like part of eastern Oregon, all the way across Idaho, some of the locations. Uh, this is the, the west, uh, including up here in, in Vancouver Island and North California. And uh, all the way down, we, every year we go to New Mexico and everything in between. So we've been, and I've been, done a little bit of work in central California, um, just collecting everything I find on all kinds of plants. Um, and so I want to tell you just a, a few of the interesting things I've seen. So I've actually resolved a couple of the interesting, or a couple of the things we had questions about, or I had questions about in terms of yellow cards in the West. Uh, we get a lot of this thing that uh, is a kind of smallish psyllid on yellow sticky traps, sometimes by the hundreds. And I've been involved in sticky trapping for beet leaf hopper for many years in the Columbia Basin, and sometimes would see this by the many hundreds on yellow cards, never knew what it was. And a bunch of field work and some, some tips from a couple of people who actually read literature on psyllids suggested uh, what it might be. And it looks like it's this European species. It's called Trioza kinopodii. And it feeds on uh, things that look like um, lamb's quarter, but it's actu they're ap actually atriplex species. And I've, I've collected that all over the West uh, on various uh, things that are the atroplex. And then I also found uh, that this species, uh, Bact Bacteriscera maculopenis, feeds on bindweed and uh, is far more widespread than was previously known. So I get that all over the West on, on bindweed, at least in dry habitats. And then uh, another species or group of species we see a lot on yellow sticky traps is uh, this kind of orangish red uh, category. And it turns out that, that most of those, I think, are in the genus Aphilera, and they feed on Rumex, which is also known as Doc. It's quite a few different species. I find this genus or this category, I'm not sure if it's a genus or group of genera, um, all over the West on Rumex, from the highest mountains um, to, to the, the lowest valleys and on the coasts. So you might be wondering whether I'm going to say anything about potato salads. I actually have an interesting story about potato salads I want to tell you. And that's the reason I think um, I ended up offering up this talk is, is uh, tell you an interesting story about our recent trip to the Southwest. So there were interesting findings. I'm just going to mention a couple that, uh, before I get to the Southwest. So I started off my very first place I did anything that I found of interest was at Stanfield was the bittersweet nightshade spot, the first place I found that. Up here in Walla Walla, I also found potato salads in downtown Walla Walla living on ornamental sweet potatoes. You know, I'm not sure. You, you, just, you find them everywhere you look, if you look. And here at home, um, found potato salads, for example, on uh, greenhouse-grown peppers in the local uh, transplant stores. And then in the southwest, last year, we were driving across, we came down Nevada and we were going across southern Utah. And unbeknownst to me, I was, at the time, I had collected some psyllids and some aphids on gray rabbit brush on the edge of the forest in Dixie National Forest. And when I got home, mounted those up, it's like, oh, these are potato psyllids. So here we are in the forest. Uh, so it's kind of a mixed forest of pines and things like that. And in the open areas, you're going to have some rabbit brush which m many people might call a sagebrush. I'll have a picture of it here in a second. And then here I also picked up that same year potato psyllids on rabbit brush in the edge of the forested kind of rabbit brushy area. These are the San Francisco mountains. Flagstaff is here, mountains here, and then you get, you're starting to leave the forest going into the desert. Potato psyllids, easy to find on rabbit brush in both of these places. And so on a given rabbit brush plant, you know, you might think, oh, it's just random chance I'm finding a potato salad. Well, I would get five or ten easy with my little beading board on one bush in a given place. So they're clearly, at that time of year, and this was September, early October, uh, spending a lot of time on rabbit brush in this kind of habitat. So just showing this picture again, uh, this year the interesting thing was uh, down here in uh, the Sierra Blanca range, uh, Alamogordo is about here, and there's the White Sands Desert. And uh, again, we go here for a geology conference. So while my significant other, Gina, is doing geology, I go collect uh, insects. And um, 
So the first interesting thing, it, you know, maybe I should have known to find this, but I was finding potatoes growing on the mountain. Uh, this is Nogal Peak, and look at the elevation, it's almost 10,000 feet. The trail starts over here, this is the White Mountains Wilderness, and I was walking up here, and somewhere along in here I was in an oak thicket, and there's potatoes growing in the oak thicket. Anybody would recognize them as potatoes, they just like, look like any other potato. You might think somebody had dropped some from their lunch or something, you know, or whatever. And, and they're growing in the oak thicket. Probably should have known I might find that, but I, I, it was a surprise to me. The next day, I was at a different place uh, south of there um, in the same mountain range called Bluff Springs. Again, no, notice the elevation, over 8,000 feet here. And uh, hiking along and finding potatoes everywhere I went. And so some of these plants are obviously not potatoes, but like these up here under this tree and up in here and back in there. It's not a very good photo because all I had was my iPhone on the day, but uh, potatoes everywhere under the trees. And again, you'd look, anybody would recognize them as potatoes. So I picked the first uh, plant that looked uh, reasonable to me, and sure enough, there's potato psyllids on these plants. So here's a close-up. Lots of other insects like the potatoes in these uh, forests. Uh, everywhere you go, they're just hammered by uh, flea beetles, other things eating the leaves, and there's aphids and psyllids on them in many places under the trees. And this is one of the psyllids. I managed to get some home, took a picture of it. It's clearly potato psyllid. Uh, Kylie Swisher has done the uh, haplotyping on that, and that's a southwestern haplotype. That's what everybody predicted when I told them I found psyllids down there. So thank you, Kylie, for doing that. This is uh, the leaves that I got the psyllids from. And uh, again, like I said, they look like any other potato. So as I travel around uh, in this general area, if you're in a, in a stream basin on the edges of the forest, under the trees, potatoes are a very common understory plant. It had been a wet season, so that might be why they were more apparent than other times. Um, but uh, it, uh, and psyllids were really easy to find. And again, this was uh, about the 1st of October when I was doing this work. So I, after finding this, I went back to my hotel room that night and looked up John Bamberg's paper from 2003. Um, he is a potato geneticist at the Germplasm Repository in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. And he's done a whole lot of field work, much like I do, except collecting potatoes. And so basically the interesting slide here is after all of his uh, research, all of his field work, he had collected a lot of potato samples from Arizona, New Mexico, and western Texas. This is one species, a Solanum jamesii. And this is the, the other one, it, at the time was called Solanum fendleri. I guess it has a different name now. There's been some taxonomic shuffling. But the point is, there's two species of potato that live down there. They look very similar. They live in similar habitats and mixed, mixed uh, pine forests mainly, um, and mainly under the trees. And so as you can see, it, you know, they're, they're pretty, they're common here and in all the mountain ranges in Arizona and New Mexico. And for those of you who don't know, this is also a mountain range here in Texas. So if we go back here, you know, I showed you I found potato psyllids on rabbit brush in southwest Utah. Well, there's some potatoes in the forests of southwest, southwest Utah as well. And even wild potatoes up here in northern Colorado in a, in a, in a herbarium record, I think it is, from Nebraska. So for, for me, when I, when I hear this kind of story, I've heard this story about the zebra chip all these years, I start thinking about this. The psyllid is native. I'm only interested in the native biology. I'm not only interested, but when it comes to my weekend and vacation time research, that's what I'm interested in. So the insect is native. Where did it live before people? Because it's been here a lot, lot longer than people have been. Um, so it seems that uh, probably it, it lived in the mountains in the summertime. That's where potatoes are, naturally. And uh, so the question is, where does it go during the winter? Based on my visits in the fall to the southwest, it seems to go downslope and spend the winter on other plants. One of them is obviously rabbit brush, probably evergreens, and maybe desert inhabiting Solanaceae is where it lived during the winter, naturally. Um, and nowadays, it goes down slope during the winter, and in at least South Texas, it finds potatoes growing there. So it's probably really happy with that situation. 
and it has allowed a, a totally different biology than it had before. So I, you know, I'm, I know this has been talked about before, whether or not potato psyllid in mountains could be relevant to the crop. I don't know whether it is or isn't, but there are a lot of mountain ranges in Arizona, New Mexico, a little bit in, in West Texas, and, and these mountains, some of these mountains in uh, Mexico surely have potatoes on them. And it might, you know, if, I, if it was me on my weekends, if I lived in South Texas and I could get into Mexico, I would love to go and look at these mountains and see what's going on there. Um, nowadays, agriculture is so dominant in a lot of places, it may not be that the natural biology is important anymore. But still, I, I think it's worth having a look at. So this is a, a needles overlick in Utah this year. I want to thank Gina and my dogs for the company, and uh, it's funded by, funded by us on all of our vacations.